Good morning. Good afternoon. Well, I didn't expect to be sitting like this after an injury that I had, and we'll, we're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, but here we are. We were figuring out how this is going to work, but I think we have a solution here. Um, I appreciate you guys withstanding the warmth in here. I bet you didn't know you were coming to hear a sermon on hell, but just kidding. It's not true, theologically. So today we're starting a new series, and for those of you who have been with us, you know that we actually had a mini-series over the last uh, couple months, Pastor Julie really talked about togetherness. And the reason why we really wanted Pastor Julie to do that was because we see ourselves as part of a larger community, which is the Forest Lake Church. After all, this is an extension of the Forest Lake Church. We're just another service. Um, when you get baptized here, you get baptized in the Forest Lake Church. And, and so Julie is a, a good bridge for that. And she gave us um, just an amazing journey on togetherness. And we, out of that, we have small group that have started. And, and it's been a, a blessing to see people really grasp the idea, as that is one of our, um, our values at the Forest Lake Church is togetherness. And before that, if you remember, um, the, the, the series specific to Warehouse was What is Church? And so we defined what that was, and, and we closed that out. I had the, the privilege to close out that series, introduce Pastor Julie to talk about togetherness, and now we're starting, it's not a mini-series, it's we're going to go on a journey, um, and the title of this series is Who is This Man? If you've been in church all your life, maybe um, you know who I'm talking about, maybe it's pretty obvious, and maybe there's some of you who, I know there are a few of you who are, are new to church and new to what it means um, to be a follower of of Jesus. But I have a question for you, and that question is, have you ever gotten ahead of yourself? Have you ever um, been down a rabbit hole or an idea or a thought where you, you get excited about it, and you just are enthused, and you just start planning ahead, you go down, um, you research something, you make plans for something that hasn't even happened. You've gotten... Um, ahead of a thought, or maybe it's um, a job that maybe you think you're going to land and you just start buying everything that you need for it, or, or you, you're just that kind of person that just gets excited about something and, and you, just, you just get ahead of yourself. Or, or some people use the term, you jump the gun. Fellas, don't ever jump the gun on a proposal, because we've seen how that lands. As a matter of fact, there's someone who got engaged here who was in Africa last year, I heard. Abby Niemeyer, are you, are you here somewhere? You got engaged somewhere. I know you're here. Congratulate. Abby was our, our babysitter for, for Adeline, and, and uh, we just found out this morning that she got engaged. So um, didn't jump the gun there. I guess the timing was right. But I know there's some other ladies in here who wish they would jump the gun from my conversations with you guys. But maybe that's your personality. You get ahead of yourself too fast. You, you, you get so excited and you, you forget that there's a place to start and you got to move with time and, and you don't want to go too far ahead because you might get your hopes, um, your hopes might be get let down or, or maybe um, you focus on the wrong thing. So we did this idea, this, this series on what is Jesus, I mean, what is church, and now we're going into who is this man, specifically talking about the life and teachings of Jesus. Now you're probably thinking, well, we're, you probably want to talk about Jesus first before you talk about the church, and, and there's a reason why, and you'll understand why we're going into this, but in order for there to be a church, there had to be Jesus. So we're in the book of John, if you have your Bibles, um, we're going to start in the book of John um, John 1, and if you're familiar with your Bible, you know that this is part of what? Four books called what? The Gospel, meaning the good news. And I'm going to read a few verses, and we're going to talk about it as we begin to embark on asking the question, who is this man, the life and teachings of Jesus? 
starts in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness cannot, did not comprehend it. So John, if you, if you know, you know that we see the story of Jesus in four different books. And this is unique because in the very beginning, we don't see the name Jesus. In fact, we see something else. We see the word, word. In the beginning was the word. And it's unique because that word is used logos, and it's actually in the Greek, and it's actually an action word. John 1 is unique for several reasons because it tracks the length of Jesus' public life. So we know he, Jesus was baptized, and before then he was a pretty private individual. But after he gets baptized, his life becomes public. He's out, he's doing miracles, he's, he's, he's preaching and he's teaching and he's gathering his disciples. And, and we know that John tracks his public life because it refers to Jesus going to the synagogue, the temple, three times. And, and this would happen once a year. The Jewish men would go, if they were able to, they would go once a year to the synagogue to, in Jerusalem for the annual festival where all men would go. And John tells us throughout, throughout his book, if you read it, three different times where Jesus goes. And we, we men, he mentions this specifically. So we know that his public life was three years. And in the last time that John refers to Jesus going to uh, Jerusalem for the annual festival, this is when he's actually arrested and he's taken captive. And from there he's tried and he's crucified. And if you've read the Gospels, maybe you think this is inconsistent. Well, why is it naming Jesus? Why are there specific references in this book and not in the other books? This isn't a reason to challenge the that there are inconsistencies in Scripture. In fact, here's why. Many of you probably, uh, may maybe you've witnessed a car accident. Maybe I, I actually saw one if you're on 434 or 436, say an accident happens. You know there's four different directions where uh, cars are traveling. And usually in an accident, God forbid there is one, something happens and people get out of the car. They, they make sure that the people are okay. Um, the, the, the ones involved that they, you know, nothing's hurt. They call 911, uh, you know, typical stuff of what happens when there's a car accident. What will happen after, and I've heard this from a, a friend of mine who is a police officer, is they will get stories or they will ask people who witnessed the event what happened. And most of the time, it, without fail, he will tell me, I will get different varying stories of what happened. And the reality is, is when we see an event like that or we witness anything, when we retell the story, we retell it from the things that impacted us the most. Any situation, I'm using the car accident thing as just a, an example, that we will tell a story back and we will leave the parts in that are most impactful to us. And, and, and the reason for that is because there are things that, in our past, our, our, what we're made up of, our experiences, our life journey that will impact us differently than someone else. And those are the things that we will clearly remember. It's not to say that the stories are inaccurate, but some details are explicit in someone's story. Maybe in someone else's, it isn't. Maybe the person in the accident will know how it happened and what angle. And, and the, they'll say the average speed that it was going. And someone else won't even say that. They'll talk about the people who were involved and the scars and, and, or the bruising or whatever, the, the trauma that happened to the individual when they're retelling the story. And the gospel is that way. The gospel is the four. You have four different accounts telling the story of this man who they journeyed with. One person was actually told this story. But each telling their version of it, how they experienced Jesus, how they experienced life with him, leaving, putting in the details that they thought were important. And as we know, scripture is, a, is man written, inspired by the, our thoughts inspired by God. And so we, he, we see here in the book of John a specific reference to the term, the word. 
And he's actually, what he's doing is he's pointing us back to the very beginning of Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he's referencing the, the term word. And actually, Jesus, the name Jesus isn't referred to in the book of John until later. But that word logos is meant to, to define who Jesus is in the book of John. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God. And through Jesus, nothing could have been made. Who is this man? It's, it's someone who we continue to talk about 2,000 years later. We're going to go on a really beautiful journey on looking at the life and teachings of who Jesus is. But in order for us to get there, we have to understand the, the importance of Jesus. Some people in the world believe Jesus was just an ordinary man. Some religions say Jesus was not the Son of God. I remember as a chaplain, I, I, I went to pre, pray for someone who um, was diagnosed with cancer, and I said, can I pray with you? And they said, yes, but do not say in Jesus' name, because I can talk directly to God. It was a, a, a misinterpretation of Scripture, because if we follow Scripture, we know that Jesus and God are one and the same. John uses the word word specifically for several reasons, but one is the Stoics back in his time would use this word to define how the earth would continue to work. They would use this as a, as a principle of divine reason that caused the natural creation to continue to grow. Some would say intelligent design. This is the word that they would use. So John is not only appealing to the Christ follower, the person who, he's, who is searching and, and wanting to know who this man is, but he's also using a word that attracts people who don't acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, but he uses the word logos, and it captures them. And he says, why is he using this word in this context? He's using the same word. He says, the, the person... The being that you say is behind the, the nature that is continuing to grow, this man is actually God, one in the same. In the beginning was the word. And as he begins this gospel, he begins to echo what we see in Scripture. Now, if we, if we follow Scripture through, through from beginning to end, we know that there are prophetic words in the book of Jeremiah, even in Genesis and Malachi, Hosea of a coming Messiah. Something is coming. Something is coming. And John says, in order for you to understand where we're going to be, you got to start with the one who made it all possible. He goes on to say, the word was with God, and in him all things were created. Without, without, nothing, without him, nothing was created. In other words, without Jesus, humanity could not be in existence. And making this statement, it's letting the reader know that there is no way that you could exist without the Word, without Logos, without Jesus. He excludes any possibility that the Word has no value. In fact, he's emphatic about it in using that specific Word for us to tie him back to Jesus. Anybody remember the show Captain Planet? You guys remember that? Maybe you don't. I showed this to my brother-in-law, and he's like, what is that? And then he said, oh, I know who the Planeteers were. And I'm like, bro, you just Googled that. You did not know who these guys were. I remember watching this show as a young kid and eating my Sunday breakfast. My favorite was eggs, tater tots, orange juice, lots of it. And just sitting and watching Captain Planet. I don't know why I love this show so much, but... If you're familiar with it, you, re, you know that they do this thing where they're like, earth, wind, power, and they have like these rings. And, it, and then they say, with your powers combined, Captain Planet comes to the rescue, right? Usually there's like a tragic, like um, catastrophic event in the world and they need Captain Planet to save it. Now I'm not equating Captain Planet with God. I'm putting that out there right now, nor am I equating Captain Planet with the Godhead. But in the same way, this is the function of the Godhead. 
all three needing to be in existence and alive and working together for us to be created beings, each having their role and together becoming one. Jesus being part of the Godhead. Make no mistake, Jesus is the Son of God. He died and he rose again. And if everybody tells you differently, they're confused. It's all throughout Scripture. It is what we preach about. It is what we what we teach about. Without Jesus, we are nothing. The Godhead, Father, Spirit, and Son. We can think about this as liquid or water taking on different forms if you'd like. Water, liquid can take water can take on three different forms. Solid, liquid, and gas. Now this is probably going into like eisegesis where you're like taking your own interpretation of the text. But you could probably assign each part of the Godhead with one of those forms, solid, liquid, and gas. I believe that each part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all have specific parts throughout Scripture and in time where they were the most needed. If you look at the Old Testament, God is interacting with man. He's at the burning bush with Moses. He's with the people of Israel, but that we also see mentions of the Spirit there as well. But God is the most prominent in the Old Testament. There are mentions of the Holy Spirit. There's prophetic word about who is coming. And then we get to the New Testament. We're now the first book, four books refer to this man who's come down. His name is Jesus, the Word. This idea of the word, it's, it's an action. It was because God spoke, there had to be action. And that action was Jesus doing the action. He was the word. And at, now in our time, as Jesus, we see in the book of Acts, as we were journeying through what is church, Jesus leaves and he leaves us the Holy Spirit, which we believe we are in the time of, of, of the spirits working in our hearts and, and, and moving and being with us until the latter day. But going back to the fall of man, God with Jesus created man to live in perfect harmony. It wasn't in God's plan for us to be in the situation that we're in. This is not his intention for us to suffer when the AC isn't working in this building. It wasn't his intention to have heartache, pain, to be hurt by people, to be hurt by the church. That was never his intention. His intention was to, be, to make us perfect human beings, to live in harmony with our creator, Jesus Christ, with the Godhead. And we know something happened. He tells the very, in the very beginning of time, since John is pointing back to Genesis, we'll go there too. In the, in the very beginning, God tells Adam and Eve, you can eat from all these trees except for that one. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Here's the thing. No matter what situation you're in, just like Adam and Eve, the odds are always in our favor. God did not intend for us to be in this situation, but he always had a plan. The odds were always in our favor. It wasn't the intention for Adam and Eve to fall. He gave him all these trees. He surrounded him with all the opportunity to be successful, to live in harmony. But God is always a God of choice. He didn't create us to control us. He created us to be free. And he said, you can eat of all these, but do not eat of that tree. And even though the odds were in their favor, they still chose to eat from that tree. But God said, I still have a plan. That plan is the word. That plan is Jesus. No matter how many times you push them away, no matter, no matter how many times you feel distant, the odds are always in your favor. They were in Adam and Eve's, they were, Adam and Eve had those odds in their favor. I think back to my own life where I made some pretty bad 
decisions, some pretty stupid choices. And I, I think of specific situations where I was going down a path and I would, I knew the decisions I was going to make and I would ignore phone calls. I would ignore people who I knew were going to speak life into me. I ignored options, decisions, and choices that I could have made. And looking back, that was God putting the odds in my favor to avoid making bad decisions that eventually led me down a dark path. And maybe you think back on your life or you're in a situation where you've known, you've ignored people, you've avoided that person, or maybe you're the person who has, is being ignored. Well, your phone call is being ignored. You're being avoided, trying to help someone. God using you to put the odds in, the, in favor for somebody. What are the things in your life that you're ignoring, the, 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 the trees that God is putting in your life to avoid the one that you shouldn't eat from? What is that? For Adam and Eve, that plan, as we look in Genesis, that plan after the fall of man was to send Jesus, the promise that Jesus would overcome whatever obstacle man would have. And we know what happens after that. But this was never our intention to live this way, but God always had a plan. Check out what it says in John uh, 20, verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. This is the promise that we're given. It would only make sense for the one, the action, the word that created us be the only other being, the God, who could bring us back to life. When Adam and Eve ate from that tree, we were destined for death. We died. Jesus created man as the action of God's word. The only thing that makes sense is for him to be the person who brings us back to life. So Jesus is there at creation and he's there at our recreation. The plan coming down as a baby in a manger to restore that which was lost. It was the only way it could work. It was the only plan that would work for us to have eternal life again was to bring back the person who created us. The action, the word, Jesus. He's called Savior for a reason. You can't have a Savior if there isn't something needing saving from. So what do you need saving from? God always has a plan. He was there at the beginning. He's promised throughout Scripture. And He's promised to be with us until the end. No matter how many times you've turned your back, no matter how many times you've pushed Him away, no matter how many times you've been in the Adam and Eve situation where, yeah, the odds are in your favor, there is other choices you can make, but still, you defy that, the odds are still in your favor. There is still hope. There is still someone who's there to rescue you whenever you are ready, and his name is Jesus. You had life at the beginning of time, but we failed. But God says you can have life again and again and again because of my son, because of the word, because of the action of who I am. And his name is Jesus, the one I couldn't do it without. He still lives. I get ahead of myself all the time. I've said it before, if you know who I am, if you know me, I get into something, I get into something. I buy everything. Vanessa can't stand sometimes when I just get obsessed over a sport. Hint, what happened here? When I get into any hobby, I have to like research it. I get analysis paralysis, can't make a decision. But I start making all these plans about purchasing something and, and I don't even know if I'm going to buy it yet. Or I get into a sport and, and I just, just go 100 miles an hour. 
Here's the proof in my leg. I told you I'd tell you what happened. Some of you guys know already. I hadn't played basketball in a long time. As soon as I say basketball, everyone's like, yep, there you go, you're too old to play that. I, I see some former people I played with. I see Leo and Ernesto over there. Back in the day, I'm not the same anymore. Um, I wanted to play again, and the reason why is this basketball brought me so much joy. I played in, in high school, and just, it was like my life. I mean, it, it's, you eat, eat, breathe, play. Like, it was like the only, one of the only sports we had back here, back, back then. We, don't, they don't, we didn't have the sports they have now. And uh, I quit playing. I got into other things, other activities and exercise programs. Um, but I remembered how much joy it brought me. And I remember like going to bed, and this was happening more and more. I was, for some reason, I would like, what would put me to sleep was thinking about like moves on the court, like what I used to do. And I was like, man, I want to play again. Like, I think I still got it. You know, like, I'm still nice. And, you know, my brother, my, both my brother-in-laws were like, you guys need to play again. Like, why aren't you playing? Like, come on. And I'm like, no, no, like, I'm not trying to do that. And finally, finally I caved and I said, well, I'm going to start playing again. So I bought shoes, two pairs, because you got to change them up. And I, I got into playing and um, without thinking, I just, I started playing. I had super I had a lot of fun, you know, the first time I went, it was, I mean, I had so much fun, even Vanessa was like, I'm, it's good to see you, like, excited about this again, I'm like, yeah, like, I love it, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape, like, I exercise, so it's been pretty good, like, making the transition, and um, I remember, uh, this was two weeks ago now, uh, that morning, or that, that whole day, my heel was bothering me, and I'm like, man, my heel just, like, really hurts, but didn't pay attention, I went from, like, not playing at all to like now playing weekly and like for like two or three hours and I remember my heel bothering me and I'm like ah, I'm like where's my mobility ball I have this like ball that I'll like roll my leg my foot on and like anywhere like just for loosening muscle I couldn't find it and I'm like oh whatever once I warm up I'll be fine um, so I did kind of my normal stretching whatever put my shoes on I went to play very first game I'm just like not feeling great, but I'm like, I gotta come out here, like it's whatever, like I don't need to inch into this, I'm going all in. I'm skipping the steps. And all of a sudden, it's a fast break, I, I cut the guy off from, from getting to the basket, so he pulls the ball back out, and I step to go back to him, and all of a sudden I feel, I thought someone lost a basketball on the side and it hit my leg. And when, he, when I say, when I've told people that, and you've had this injury, you know exactly what it is. But I look back and there was no ball. And immediately I knew it's my Achilles, like I know it. And as soon as I put force on the ground with my foot, it was just like, just not moving. So I hobbled over to the side and um, Chris, PT, uh, was luckily there and he kind of goes down my leg and I'm like, please, please, like feel something. And he's like, no, it's gone, man. You ruptured your Achilles. And I'm like, <sighs> and all of a sudden, all this is just like going in my mind. I'm just like, we were supposed to leave to New York in two days. Like, that's the worst city to go to if you're injured like this. Like, you got to walk everywhere. I'm like, well, maybe I can just like hop down the steps into the subway. Like, you know, someone can carry a wheelchair. Like, I have, to, I've been wanting to go to New York for so long. And I'm like, okay, like, I got to go to New York. Like, I got to speak. Like, I, how am I going to drive? This is my right foot. Like, all these thoughts are just going through my mind. The things that just really, in hindsight, they don't really matter. But here I am just freaking out about all of these things. So I, I managed to, to drive home with my right foot on the gas and my left foot on the brake. Very dangerous, by the way. Um, but it was like 10 at night, so like no one was on, on the road. And I didn't blame God, but I said, what, what can I learn from this situation? And I know myself, one of the things is I needed to just stop. I'm a person that's always active. I got to be like, I can't be in the house for too long. I got to always be doing something, working towards something, figuring something out, or, or just keeping my mind 
busy, and this was going to be a huge challenge. The blessing so far has been I've gotten to enjoy the last couple of weeks before Adeline goes to first grade. Spend time with her. She's been my nurse, helping me grab things and being an amazing nurse at that. I've gotten to enjoy my family now that summer's over and Vanessa has to go back to work. I've gotten to invest in relationships where usually I'm just like always on the go. I'd have to sit there now and have conversations. And I've been fortunate enough to do that. But what I realize is I tend to get ahead of myself and I forget what's most important. And maybe some of you, maybe you haven't ruptured your Achilles. But I've seen so many people in church. They give their life to Christ. And I turn my back and I meet with them again and they're just fixated on a rule. They're fixated on a, a religious idea. They're fixated on a diet. And they harp on that, and it's the one thing that they want to die for. And I never once hear the name Jesus. I never hear about how they got to where they were. As a religion, as, as a community of people, we're guilty of doing the same thing. We get so ahead of ourselves that we forget where we came from. We forget the person who saved us because we jump the gun. John says, before you go any further, before you start talking about what you read in Scripture, let's not forget that without Jesus, you are nothing. Without Jesus, this world would not exist. Without Jesus, you don't have new life. Without Jesus, you don't have a story to tell. So before you get fixated on a religious idea, on a thought, on something that it matters, but something matters more. If you can't preach Jesus through a religious idea, a thought, or a conviction, it's not worth talking about. If Jesus can't be seen through your life of faith and your journey, it's not worth it. This word, this action, behind what the Father said is what he used to create us. No diet, no rule, no tradition, no law existed before Jesus. It's because of Jesus that we build those things upon, and some are not worth dying for. We fought some as a church that are not worth giving time to. Jesus' most effective ministry when he was on earth was being with people, loving them ministering to their needs. And then he preached to them. This generation has a low comfort level with military metaphors and faith. We prefer to think of following Jesus as, as a lifestyle or a convenience or a journey rather than a war. But the reality is, since the fall of man, there has been a war over our hearts. Satan and Jesus fighting for each and every one of us. If Jesus is just a journey or a convenience for you, he needs to be your savior. He needs to be the person that you give your life to each and every day. It starts with Jesus. He's not just a convenient person. He has to be our center point. He's not just a convenient God to access when we want to, because that's the trap. So we forget where we came from. We forget that that was the source of being able to be where we are today. If what you're teaching others cannot be transparent enough for others to see what Jesus is at the core, then it isn't worth teaching. So where are you getting ahead of yourself? Where in your life are you jumping the gun? And maybe this is in your spiritual life, in your journey with Jesus. Maybe you've, you've lost focus. If you're being honest with yourself, have you lost focus of what really matters? Is Jesus still your foundation? Or is it convicting someone else 
about something they're doing wrong, your foundation? Or is it making yourself feel better about pointing at what someone else is doing wrong, your foundation? If Jesus is your foundation, if he's there at the beginning, then what comes first is love, acceptance, regardless of where you may vary with someone else on a doctrinal belief or not. Because none of that matters if we didn't have Jesus to bring us to life again. Where are you getting ahead of yourself? Where are you jumping the gun? What are the things that you're pointing to that makes Jesus not the center point in your life? Or maybe you're not even at that point of having a belief, but you, you've restructured your foundation and, and, and so that Jesus is no longer in your life at all. Here's the thing. You may feel lost. You may feel like you've gone too far. You may feel... Like maybe this, you don't even belong here. But time and time again, Jesus surrounds you so that the odds are always in your favor. Maybe he's not your center point. Maybe he's not your foundation. But here's the good news. Here's the gospel. He can be. And he will always be there. And maybe this is your opportunity and your moment to say, I've lost sight of what's important. I've lost sight of what matters. I'm focusing on the wrong things. I'm, I'm going to be honest with myself. He's not the person I go to to give my life to every morning. It's not a daily thing that I do. But guess what? It's not too late. He can be. In the beginning was Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. He was with God. And without Jesus, we do not exist. And He was the plan for, that, for us for when we fell and we turned our backs on God. He was the plan so that we could access the Godhead again. So who is this man? Well, he's the most, most important thing in this church. He's the most important thing in my life. Creation started with him. Life was made new with him. And it will all end with him. Seventh day Adventist, the advent, the coming, that's what we believe in. Jesus coming back to finish what he started. So where are you in your journey? Do you know who this man is? If not, journey along with us to learn the beautiful life of a man who was fully God and fully man, who gave his life, who left eternity, who left perfection to bear the weight of the sins of a world, even for those who would still turn his back, he still died for them as well. His name is Jesus, and he's always putting the odds in your favor. Father God, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that there is your son who came to give us new life. Lord, as we establish the foundation of this church, of your church. May he be our foundation. May he, he be the single most important thing in our life that anything we put upon this, we can see Jesus through. We would not be anywhere if it wasn't for the plan that you have. So Lord, whether we are convicted Christians, followers of you or not, may this be another day that we give our life to you. May it be an a daily reoccurrence where we acknowledge that you are the most important thing. Without you, we are nothing. Lord, we can't wait until your son Jesus comes back and finishes his work. Until then, God, we commit our lives to you each and every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.